Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us on V Brown Bag. I'm your host, Tom Green, and today we're going to be continuing our series on all about data protection. Uh, tonight, we're going to have Howard Marks come back and talk to us about the history of disk drives. And I... Am I showing my screen? Can you see my screen, Howard? Yes, I see your screen. Okay, cool. It wouldn't be V Brumbag without a uh, a glitch, huh? Hey. This conferencing technology, it almost works. Almost. All right. Um, as always, I'll be monitoring... Um, I'll be monitoring the uh, Twitters. You can get me at uh, V Brown Bag using Twitter hashtag V Brown Bag. Our shows are international. If you're in a uh, time zone that's not US based, feel free to check out one of our other shows. And with that, I'm going to hand everything over to Howard to continue our t discussion. Howard? Very good. Yeah. There we go. I've got your screen. Okay. So, welcome to All About Data Protection Part 2. And today we're going to look at the evolution of the disk drive and of the RAID systems that hook those disk drives together. Um, ending you know, somewhere around 1995. In case you've forgotten, I am your not-so-humble speaker, Howard Marks. I spent 30 years consulting in New York with organizations large and small and writing for publications from PC Magazine to network computing. Today, I run Deep Storage LLC, which is an independent test lab and analyst firm where we do things like demonstrate that scale-out storage systems can survive a node failure by causing a node failure with about 10 pounds of thermite. Um, I'm also the co-host of the Graybeards on Storage podcast with my associate, Ray Lucchese. You can find Graybeards on Storage on iTunes, Stitcher, and your favorite podcast application. So, Last week, we talked about the basics of RAID and about Patterson and Gibson and Katz's seminal paper and how that became the industry that we now lovingly live, work in. Um, but <clears throat> that academic paper didn't fully address the requirements of real users in the field. Um, for example, we probably want to run RAID 1 because it provides the best performance for small IOs like a database server and database servers were and remain the number one application that we worry about as storage guys. Uh, but RAID 1 meant we could only have as much capacity as Seagate would sell us in a single drive. Um, so if we wanted additional capacity, we had to come up with combination or compound RAID. Compound RAID is simply using the logic behind more than one of the standard RAID levels at the same time. It was a lot more common than it is today when we have much more flexible storage systems. But I remember running a series of Windows NT 3.5, yeah, 3.51 servers connected to uh, EMC symmetrics with fat differential SCSI cables. And that symmetrics ran RAID S with nine gigabyte drives. So all it could deliver to me was virtual nine gigabyte volumes, but my exchange database needed 30 gigabytes of space. So I would take those nine logical volumes from the SIM 
and stripe across them do raid zero in the windows volume manager um, there's a lot of debate that you will find on the net talking about the relative merits of raid zero plus one versus raid one plus zero and the argument basically comes down to if you're mirroring across two RAID 0 sets and a drive fails in one of those RAID 0 sets, then the entire RAID 0 set will go offline. And so any second drive failure will result in data loss. But if you stripe across multiple RAID 1 sets and a drive fails, you'll only lose data on the next drive failure if that drive was the mirror of the first drive that failed. And while that logic holds, if the two types of RAID <clears throat> are being performed by independent processes, that is, if you have, in my, like my example, RAID S, being provided by the symmetrics and then RAID 0 being provided by the Windows Volume Manager. Then if the RAID 0, if a drive fails in a RAID 0 set, the function, software, RAID controller, whatever that's providing the RAID 0 will take the whole set offline and the second drive failure will be catastrophic. But if they're both provided by the same logical device, the RAID controller, this logical volume manager, whatever, then if you look very carefully at these slides, you'll see that the data is written to the disks exactly the same way with RAID 0 plus 1 and with RAID 1 plus 0. And if the whole thing is under the control of one piece of software, it knows that if drive two failed, that it can still access the drive on, on disk three so that drive one and two can fail as long as drive zero and one remain working, regardless of whether we call it RAID 10 or RAID 0 plus one. This is the way mid-market to enterprise storage systems, whether they're software-defined storage or um, hardware defined storage, for lack of a better term, works. And so the argument is really moot unless you're talking about combinations of different providers at the different functions. In order to really understand the evolution of storage systems, it's important to have some knowledge of the evolution of disk drives that make those storage systems up. And this adventure into disk drive history is going to be quite personal. This is the kinds of disk drives I have dealt with in my career or have been common in areas that I might not have worked in, like the mainframe computer systems. Um, <clears throat> but I'm not starting with the invention of the Mercury delay line by Eckerds and Mauchly in 1947. Um, I'm talking about what over a career as an IT operations guy and a systems architect I have worked with and I've gotten to choose from. When I first entered the industry, I was working with very small computers 8-bit microprocessors, floppies only, and for larger projects with mini computers, uh, primarily both DEC and data general systems, and those mini computers used disk drives that um, were called SMD, the storage module drive. They were invented by control data and the user, the electrical and logical interfaces became a standard. These were the high performance drives of the day. They had 14 inch platters. And so if you look at the upper photo, the piece on the top that looks like a cake box is a plexiglass cover over a stack of disks that's 
in held together in an aluminum uh, hub. That's a disc pack, and uh, that disc pack would hold 80 to 300 megabytes. They had voice coil positioners, about 50 milliseconds average access time. They spun at about 4,000 RPM, and they cost tens of thousands of dollars, but they were reliable for the day with MTBFs of 50 to 100,000 hours. Uh, compare that to a million to two million hours for today's disk drives, they're not very reliable. But when we got the PC and we got into the mid 80s, those PCs used ST506 interface drives. And they had five and a quarter inch platters, but they were in a fixed enclosure. And we, we call it sealed, but it's not hermetically sealed. Every Winchester style and Whitney style, or you know, the disk drives we use today, um, up to helium filled drives, has under one of the labels that says remove this label and you avoid your warranty, um, an absolute filter. It's a, uh, beyond a HEPA filter in terms of air filtration. So the drives do breathe just a little. Um, and that means that you can't use disk drives even today's disk drives, except for the helium filled ones at altitudes above about 10,000 feet, because the air is not sufficiently dense for the heads to fly at the correct height over the disk. That um, aside aside, the ST506 drives were five and a quarter inch size. They uh, started off using stepper motor positioners that took 225 milliseconds to get from one end to the other. They only cost hundreds, not tens of thousands of dollars, but MTBF was 12 to 30,000 hours, not 50 to 100,000 hours. So they were not the most reliable thing. The other thing is both of these classes of disk drives were dumb as a bag of hammers. Disk drives had no intelligence. Data came over the skinnier of those two cables, the data cable for the ST506 interface, um, with data and clock still intermixed, coming off the head that was active. And the controller card had to provide a lot of the intelligence that we now think of as being integrated into a disk drive. The original ST506 was so stupid that it couldn't even buffer step requests. So if you wanted to go from drive 10 to drive, excuse me, from track 10 to track 20, you had to send a step command, wait for an acknowledgement, send another step command, wait for an acknowledgement. The drive also had no logic about knowing where it was. If the controller ever lost track of the active track number, it had to retract keep sending step out commands until the drive sent back a, an error and that meant it was at track zero. Uh, this meant that the drive controller had to keep track of where the heads were at all the time and it had to know the drive geometry, how many heads there were, how many tracks per surface there were, how many sectors per track there were. And it was all very um, stupid. My first company, Howard Procon. Yes, uh, I just wanted to to let you know it just brought to my attention that your webcam is on, and so apparently some people have been watching you. I don't know have I made that. any obscene gestures that someone's complained about? No, I just wanted to make sure that you were aware. I, that's fine with me. All right, cool. Sorry to interrupt your flow. I just wanted to. It's okay. I wasn't planning on like doing crack in the middle of the session anyway. All right. Well, uh, we just lost five attendees. No, go ahead. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, somebody asked me to, to bring that up. No problem. Okay. Now remember, don't pick your nose. Okay. Um, so my first company, Procomp Systems Inc., uh, built hard disk subsystems for those 8-bit microprocessors and later IBM PCs that didn't have any kind of hard drive systems. 
And we bought controllers from a company called Zbeck, and you have a photo of one of them there that I managed to find on the internet. And these controllers uh, were based on a standard called the Sugart Associate Standard Interface. The Sugart Associates was the company that introduced the five and a quarter inch floppy drive. And it was run by a guy named Al Sugart. And the company now known as Seagate Technologies um, was originally Sugart Technologies because Al started that company too after he was forced out of Sugart Associates when Xerox took it over. Uh, but Xerox sued and he had to change the name. Um, in 1982, the same thing happened to the to SASE, the Sugart Associates standard interface. Um, it became an ANSI standard, and people complained that you can't have a standard that includes the name of a manufacturer. So it was renamed SCSI, the Small Computer Standard Interface. And the brilliance of SASE and therefore SCSI was that it was a general purpose interface. There was a 50 pin connector, the one marked in green on the right, that allowed you to connect to other SCSI devices on a bus that could have originally up to eight devices because it was the small computer standard interface. And so this card would give us SASE on one side and ST506 on the other side and created a standard interface, standard command set. So we could build the little paddle card where you unplug the Z80 from the motherboard of your K-Pro and plugged our little card in and plugged the Z80 card in the socket on our card. And then the cable came out and let us connect to as many, up to eight of these ZBEC controllers or tape controllers or terminal servers, or for a while there were even SAS, uh, SCSI scanners. It was a standardized interface for all sorts of devices. And for quite a while, the best way to back up the hard drive on your NetWare file server was to have a SASE or SCSI controller on the hard drive and a SCSI tape drive and use the SCSI extended copy command to say, copy all of the data from LUN0 on controller one to LUN0 on controller two. And that copied all the data from the hard drive to the tape drive and didn't require any additional software. Now, you could only restore the entire image of the hard drive, but for a while, that was the best we had. Eventually, drives got smarter and the function that card provided, what we called the disk controller, became part of the drive. So by 1988 or 89, SCSI hard drives replaced that SCSI to ST506 card. And these drives were in the 300 gigabyte, excuse me, 300 megabyte range. Um, about the same time, Western Digital did the same thing for low cost drives and they built, took the ZBEC controller that was the card that plugged into the AT bus that controlled a drive that we had the picture of earlier and built that into the drive and they called it ATA for AT attached. Um, SAS went, is the serial version of SCSI, SAT are the serial version of ATA. Uh, we now call ATA PATA just to differentiate it from serial ATA. But the other huge change is that today's disk drives have as much memory as the large disk drives had total capacity when I started. A even capacity oriented 7200 RPM disks today have 128 to 256 megabytes of memory. So if you think back to RAID 2 and 3 that are bit or byte striped across drives, how little it makes sense to use that kind of technology in combination with drives that every time you tell them to read any data at all, 
read the whole track because they have plenty of cache memory and you might want to read more data from that track anyway. <clears throat> so all of these functions have led us to the current block addressing mechanism. And that led us to logical block addressing. So before SCSI, if you had a, an operating system or a volume manager or a file system that wanted to talk to a disk drive, the address of a given sector on the disk drive would be addressed by a cylinder. And then within each cylinder, the head and then with it, once you've gotten to a specific track by specifying cylinder and head, you would specify the sector number. Now, this whole address scheme made several substantial assumptions. One was that every track would have the same number of sectors. The second is that all of the heads would be able to be active on a given cylinder because a cylinder is just move the heads to track two and then the cylinder is every surface on track two. Um, it turns out both of those assumptions interfered with logic that we wanted to introduce later in the development of the disk drive. And the, one of the big separations or abstractions that SCSI and IDE or ATA uh, introduced was logical block addressing. Instead of having the address be this cylinder, this head, this sector, or this track, this head, this sector, it became just a logical number. The first sector on the first head on the first track is LBA0, and the blocks are just numbered sequentially from there. This is one of the things that means that you can use the same command set to write to a disk drive and a tape drive because you're just telling both of them write this data starting at LBA 7,402 and continuing on for a megabyte. Uh, so this also means that when we install a disk drive, we no longer need to tell the controller how many heads, how many tracks, how many cylinders, or how many sectors per track, that is knowledge that is contained within the drive and within the controller built into the drive. Um, once we started addressing blocks logically instead of by their physical address, we could take advantage of general geometry. You know, as we all remember from high school, the outer tracks of a circle are longer than the inner tracks of a circle. And therefore, if we're going to maintain the same bit density, if we're going to write one terabit per inch, since the outer track is an inch and a half and the inner track is only three quarters of an inch, we can write twice as much data on an outer track as an inner track or twice as many sectors. So outer tracks are longer, they have more sectors on them. Each disk is divided up into some number of zones and the outer zone has the most sectors, the next zone in has a few less sectors, and so forth. This allowed the drive vendors to vastly increase the capacity of the drive because before ZBR, every track had to have the number of sectors the innermost tracks could handle. Hey, Howard, I did have a question that came in just holding that thought. Uh, it's about SCSI. If the SC stands for small computer, when the standard was formed, is there another standard that was used for large computers? Well, IBM has always defined their own standards. And so if you wanted to attach to a mainframe, you did what IBM defined. Um, but no, the small computer was, when it was designed, it was intended for small computers. Um, but if you look at what we call large computers today, they are the descendants of what we called small computers then. Right? The PC was an x86 and everything x86 comes from that. 
the large computer has basically died off and become the mainframe. Thanks, sir. But no, there, you know, SMB was kind of the last standard for larger computers. Where was I? Oh, um, the other advantage that zone bit recording gave us that, of course, is obsolete today because we have SSDs, is short stroking. Um, if you know the, the rule of thumb is that a 15k RPM disk drive can deliver 200 IOPS, and that's based on how long it takes to access data on average across the whole drive. But if you only fill the drive a third or a quarter of the way, not only have you made seeks shorter because you're only writing to the outer tracks, each of those outer tracks holds more data. So it increases the performance boost that you get from short stroking. Um, it's also the cause of the problem that, that people in the media and entertainment business talk about, which is you know, never let your disks get over 80% full. Not only does that create file system garbage collection overhead, but it also means you're writing to those innermost tracks and that means that there are more head motions per megabyte. And since head motions take milliseconds and writes only take microseconds, head motions are to be avoided. The other thing that happened very quickly is that little disks grew up and killed off big disks. In 1980 or 81, we were dealing with 14 inch disk drives and we bought these drives from a company called Priam. And like the drive in the photo, they used a linear voice coil. But while the drive in the photo is a five and a quarter inch disc, these Priam drives were 14 inch drives and the voice coil was about four inches in diameter. And we brought one of these things that, you know, 33 megabytes, we sold it for $6,000. We brought one into a client to demonstrate. We set it up on a conference table and we started it seeking. And there was so much mass in the voice coil and the head assembly that the drive seeking with the voice coil going in and out caused the whole table to shake. Um, but spinning smaller disks have several advantages. Um, the first is they use a lot less power. Spinning a disk, spinning a larger disk takes a lot more power than spinning a smaller disk. It's somewhere between the square and the cube of the diameters, how much power it takes to spin a disk. If we're talking about 14 or even five and a quarter inch disks, and we're spinning, trying to spin them at 15,000 RPM, that would take an enormous amount of power and therefore dissipate an enormous amount of heat. Uh, it would also, larger platters, are less stable and flutter more at the edges with the, as higher bit densities have made the disk heads fly closer and closer to the disk, flutter becomes a bigger and bigger problem. And finally, small disks perform better because they have shorter seeks. Um, if you have a 14 inch platter, the inner to outer track is probably three and a half inches. On a two and a half inch disk, it's less than an inch. Um, by 1983, the Mac Store XT 1140 was as fast as the 14 inch drives, although it was still dumb like a bag of rocks. Um, by the early 90s, IBM stopped developing new single large disk drives, the 3390 Mod 9, which was introduced in 1993, was the last of the large expensive disk drives. And since then, We've had small drives, and of course, the original name of RAID called them inexpensive drives, but they're not so inexpensive anymore because they're all we got. Um, the other big change has been that we've adopted voice coil positioners. So the earliest disk drive, the ST506, as you see at the top, um, used a stepper motor. And, that's in the upper right hand corner. There's that black thing with a silver shaft coming out of it. That shaft would rotate 
one sixty fourth of a rotation per step, and there was a steel band wrapped around it attached to the head carriage that would move the heads in and out. Now that was replaced with linear voice coils that moved directly in and out. And voice coils, first of all, gave us much higher rates of acceleration than the stepper motor, so they were much faster. But the other difference between a stepper motor and a voice coil system is that voice coil systems have closed loop servo. If you remember, I said the original ST506 was so stupid, it didn't even know what track its heads were over. Well, a modern disk drive or any disk drive with a voice coil positioner has some servo data that tells the drive where the heads are. And instead of just moving to some arbitrary position, the system moves the heads and reads the servo data and adjusts. And since it makes those fine adjustments, tracks can be much closer together. The linear voice coils have been replaced with rotary voice coils because they have lower mass and smaller size. Um, and that gives us, you know, lower mass, of course, means better performance. Um, I used, used to say at a rotary voice coil works on a pivot, just like the arm on your phonograph. And then the average person listening to my webinars became young enough that they didn't know what a phonograph, never mind. Um, and so the servo data used to be written to a dedicated surface on that disk pack. So the 300 gigabyte disk pack had 14 drives in it, had 14 platters in it. And the top surface of the top platter was exposed to too much contamination. So it was just there for uh, guard purposes. But the bottom surface of the bottom platter had servo data. And it had data that looks very much like the picture you see on the right there. The data encrypted or encoded in that each of those tracks would be what track number it is. And then the signal would be wider and narrower as it was recorded at the factory. So the drive would read the data to see what track it was over, make a gross adjustment to get over the right track, and then make fine adjustments to get the strongest signal, which means it was in the middle of that track. Now, by having a dedicated servo surface, it meant that there was no head motion required when you changed heads, that you could electronically say, read the data from head one, and then read the data from head two, and then read the data from head three. And that would just be an electronic switch, not a repositioning, so it would have very little latency. Uh, as track density got smaller and smaller, the problem became that the head comb, that that set of heads each on their own tone arm off the pivot in the rotary voice coil, the flex between the bottom head and the top head started to become almost as large as the width of a track. So just because the bottom head was in the center of the track on the servo surface, you couldn't guarantee anymore that meant that the top head would be in the center of the track for the top surface. And so the drive manufacturers switched from having a dedicated servo surface to embedding the servo data in between the sectors of the data on every surface. And so when you say, well, you don't say anymore, when the, the drive decides to read from head five, it makes those fine positionings of the drive so that head five is over the center of the track on surface five. Of course, the embedded servo data takes up less space than a whole surface on one platter, and this let the drive vendors have higher capacity as well, so lower overhead. 
it, we also get it things like the ability to deal with wider temperature ranges because the system now is compensating for different rates of thermal expansion between the platters and the head frame and even between the bottom platter that's closer to the heat of the spindle motor than the top platter which might be a degree or two cooler at the beginning of the day. Um, it also means that when you switch from head to head, there is that fine adjustment that has to take place. So we no longer think about cylinders and the logical block addressing mechanism in a given drive may not actually write to the outer track on head one and then the outer track on head two. Zones may actually be processed completely differently than that. It's all been abstracted from LBA via logical block addressing, but it's something we just don't have to worry about or think about anymore. And some old timers get confused because you know, head switch time might be greater than track to track time with some drive designs. Howard, we've got a couple more questions that have come in. Oh, good. Uh, so a follow-up on the SCSI question from Ken. He says, does IBM still use their own interface? Um, so IBM mainframes used to use an interface set called bus and tag, which is long obsolete. Uh, and then it became, you know, the current implementation is um, fiber channel hardware but the command set for IBM is different enough that it's called FICON, not Fiber Channel, and that disk arrays have to specifically support mainframes, that mainframes still, even though it comes across the same Fiber Channel cable, talk weirdly and differently enough that you have to have explicit mainframe support. And another question from Graham is, are they still only doing single head reads? You may have already addressed that. But. Well, yeah, in fact, it's embed in a, there was a very brief period where there were disk drives that would allow you to read from multiple heads on the same cylinder at the same time. Um, but once we made the transition to embedded servo, that made reading from multiple heads at the same time impossible. Um, the concept is coming back, but we'll, that's a later slide. Thanks, Howard. Uh, as disk drives hit two terabytes, the manufacturers started running into a couple of problems. Uh, the first problem was with logical block addressing, the field for the logical block and the SCSI command is only so big, and that means you can only have a maximum logical block address of, I forget whether it's a 64-bit number, or whatever it is, but there's a limit. And that limit meant <clears throat> that you could only have a two terabyte logical volume. When vendors started making two terabyte drives, solutions were found in one of the solutions, not the only one, was to make the size of each sector larger. Ever since the early 80s, when SCSI first came out, a sector was 512 bytes. Now there are 520 byte and 528 byte variations that are used for storing checksum ECC data, but they still store 512 bytes of data in that sector. So we're going to call them 512 byte drives for the sake of this conversation. We've been using 512 byte sectors since the early 80s. And the drive manufacturers decided that they could solve both the problem of the LBA range is becoming too large a number and the problem that as bits got smaller, an error in the surface of the disk that was the same physical side size would affect more bits. So disk drives have for a long time had a little bit of ECC stored with each sector. But 
little little bits of ECC can only correct errors up to two or three bits in size. If surface defects on the drive remain the same size, but bit density increased, then the number of bits affected by each defect would get larger and it would become too large for the ECC to correct. By using 4K byte sectors instead of 512 byte sectors, the vendors address both problems. They have eight times as much data in each sector, therefore we have eight times as much data in each block, and the number of blocks we have to address becomes an eighth as large. Voila, we've postponed that problem into the next decade. More significantly, by eliminating the sync field at the beginning of each sector and the gap between sectors and combining the ECC from all eight of the 512 byte sectors into one 4K byte sector, the ECC could correct errors not of two or three bits, but of 10 or 12 bits. So the ECC becomes much more effective. The problem, as with most things that we've been talking about uh, in this series about disk drives, is that this requires us now to change how we talk to the disk drive. You know, embedded servo meant we could only read and write from one head. We didn't think about cylinders anymore. Advanced format means we have to write data in ways that are friendly to a 4K device. Because if you write a, write a small write to a 4K device, now the disk, disk drive has the same read, modify, write process that it has to perform to change 512 bytes in the middle of a 4K sector that a RAID system has if you try and write 512 bytes into the middle of a 64K strike. <clears throat> in addition, old, most old operating systems write their data offset from a optimized mapping to a 4K device. Even if they're writing in their file system, 4K or multiple of 4K. You know, Windows Server 2003 is the classic bad actor. Um, every logical volume that you create in Windows 2003, logical block zero of each logical volume is at logical block one of the underlying device. And so if I write 4K to the C drive, it's going to have to read two 4K blocks, modify the first one with seven of the eight 512 byte emulated blocks, recalculate the ECC and write that sector back down, modify the other memory buffer where only the first 512 bytes changes, recalculate the ECC and write that back down. So today when you're shopping for hard drives, and I know few of you are shopping for hard drives here, shopping for SSDs, but if you're shopping for hard drives, hard drives now come in three different formats. There are 512 byte native, 512N drives. There are 512E drives that store the data on the drive in 4K sectors and get you the better ECC and slightly higher reliability and slightly higher capacity that that delivers, but that present a 512 byte block to the devices that use them. And those are the ones you have to be careful with to make sure that you've got your volume alignment so that 4K boundaries are 4K boundaries all the way down to the bottom turtle. Um, <coughs> and then there are drives that speak 4K native. Using advanced format drives requires storage system, operating system, hypervisor, you know, whatever the layer of software directly above the disk drives is, support. So VMware, for example, in, in 6.0 and earlier, 
only supported 512 byte native drives. Um, and this is true for both vSphere and vSAN. <coughs> um, starting with 6.5, they support 512E drives, and that means that they're 4K aware and they do all their writes when they make everything align properly, but they still don't support 4K native drives. Um, so while advanced format drives have some advantages, you may or may not be able to use them in your environment. The latest change that's come to market um, has been shingled magnetic recording. So it turns out that at the bit densities and types of heads that we use today, um, disk drives can read a narrower track than they can write. That, you know, for lack of uh, more technical terms, the magnetic field that writes the data on the disk can't be focused quite as tightly as the read head can read data. And so what shingled magnetic recording does is it writes a wide track of data and then moves the head you know, two thirds of a track and writes another wide track of data. And that leaves two thirds of the previous track exposed so that it can be read. <clears throat> this works perfectly well if you're doing sequential I.O. If you're writing huge amounts of data and you're not reading it back and you're writing it to sequential blocks, then it'll just write each layer of shingles slightly overlapping the next layer of shingles and you can read the data randomly, you just have to write it sequentially. Um, the problem is, if you want to overwrite data, then every track above the track you're overwriting has to be rewritten as well. So SMR drives write in zones and they may have a zone that writes standard non-overlapping tracks that can be used for like file system metadata and then zones of one megabyte to 10 gigabytes well one megabyte to a gigabyte 10 gigabytes is excessive generally in the 10 to 100 megabyte range of data that's shingled <clears throat> and if well, first of all, if it's the type of shingle drive that allows you to perform overwrites, then that overwrite will be very slow because it's going to read all the data for the zone into memory, or at least all the data for the tracks from the point you want to overwrite up. It's going to write your data, and then it's going to rewrite all the tracks above. So there are drives that, like 4K drives emulating 512 byte drives will emulate a conventional drive and just be ridiculously slow doing an overwrite in the middle of a zone. And then there are other drives that will simply refuse and are only to be used with um, storage systems that are specifically designed for SMR drives. Some vendors will occasionally use SMR, dri SMR drives in their USB external drives because the USB interface is the bottleneck anyway. Um, those of you who might go out to Best Buy and on Black Friday and buy a pile of old of external USB drives so that you can peel them open and upgrade your Synology uh, should check carefully to make sure that you are not using shingle drives in a system that isn't designed for them. The performance difference can be really substantial. <clears throat> the next step in disk drive technology um, is something out of Dr. Evil because we have disk drives with freaking lasers on them. So when we talk about magnetic materials, there's a factor or an attribute called coercivity. It is how difficult it is to coerce 
that magnetic domain to change its state. And so that high coercivity is good because it lets you have very small magnetic domains, very small bits, without worrying about the magnetic fields of adjacent bits interfering with each other. But high coercivity means you have to generate a very strong magnetic field. And that strong magnetic field may, in turn, <clears throat> affect adjacent bits. And we are reaching the limit for the materials now available to us to have bits be smaller in a material that has a consistent coercivity sufficiently high to store that data for a long period of time. But if you heat a magnetic material, that reduces its coercivity. So a heat-assisted magnetic recording drive mounts a frigging laser to the disk head. And with cycle times below one nanosecond, fires the laser, heats the spot where you're going to change it from a zero to a one, the magnetic part of the head applies the magnetic field as the spot is heated, the state of the spot changes, it cools so quickly that now it's locked in its new state. It's just way too much to believe you could actually do. But Seagate promises that we will see drives with <clears throat> heat-assisted magnetic recording in the next two years. Um, Western Digital recently announced a variation they call a microwave assisted magnetic recording where a spin torque oscillator. Now, isn't that the coolest thing you've heard of in a while? It didn't actually come from Buckaroo Banzai. You take the spin torque oscillator, it generates microwaves. The microwaves change the electron spin state of the magnetic material on the disk, which reduces its coercivity in the same cycle times of under a nanosecond, but without producing the heat and therefore with smaller impact on the adjacent bits and without the restriction that heat assisted magnetic recording has which requires that you use they use glass instead of aluminum discs because the aluminum would conduct heat away from the laser too well what all of this means is that both western digital and seagate predict that we'll have another decade of 15 to 20 percent compound annual growth reduction in the price of disk drives and the Western Digital spokes models um, have been telling me that they've and while they're now because they bought SanDisk a major flash provider uh, they're now saying that they expect to be able to maintain uh, an 8 to 10 to 1 cost advantage in dollars per gigabyte um, with spinning disks for the next decade. Um, so the disk is dead club uh, <clears throat> if the guys at Western Digital are to be believed may have to find a new clubhouse. Uh, the most recent announcement came from Seagate as a trial balloon. Um, they are reintroducing the concept of a disk drive with multiple actuators. Uh, some of the old sleds had two positioners on different sizes of sides of the 14-inch disc so that you could have uh, two heads addressing different tracks at the same time. Uh, the IBM 3380 is the last one I can think of that did that. On the 3380, uh, one positioner was responsible for the outer tracks and another one was responsible for the inner tracks. Um, in Seagate's uh, demonstration model, the two positioners split uh, upper surfaces and lower surfaces. So basically they've taken the head comb and split it in half and put both of them on the same pivot um, and separated the voice coils. <clears throat> now this kind of drive could read or write from two heads at a time. It should deliver almost exactly twice the IOPS of a uh, drive with a fixed positioner. Um, I imagine, and Seagate has hinted that, you know, they're talking about a 20 or 24 terabyte disk by the time this comes to market, and that it will actually appear 
to be two 10 terabyte or 12 terabyte disks um, so that the software doesn't have to be completely rewritten. I question whether there's a market outside uh, the hyperscalers for a device like this that delivers 200 IOPS on a 7200 RPM drive instead of 100 IOPS on a 200 RPM drive. <clears throat> and it's got to end up being sufficiently cheaper once we factor in the cost of the enclosures and drive slots and sleds and such to buy one 20, disc, 20 terabyte drive that emulates two 10 terabyte drives than to simply buy two 10 terabyte drives. Um, if you remember, I said one of the, the really big differences between today's disk drives and the, the disk drives that we started with is the amount of memory. Um, the earliest small hard drives in you know, AT class machines were, the controllers were so stupid that the data had to be interleaved. Um, so what you see in the diagram there is an interleave of four. So the controller there, if I said read sectors one through 15 was so slow that once it read sector one, it wasn't ready to read sector two until four other sectors had spun past. And so the sectors are interleaved and reading a whole track would take it on this drive would take at least five revolutions. Um, <clears throat> While today's disk drives have 128 to 256 megabytes of DRAM and therefore can only always do full track reads and writes, um, the flash disk hybrids with more flash have flopped. Um, I think as individual devices, SSDs for desktops and especially for laptops are just vastly more attractive enough to make the price difference uh, not so significant. And in enterprise or even mid-market environments, having the RAID controller individually be able to manage flash and disk pools is much more effective. Um, vendors have also tried introducing drives with various HTTP interfaces like key value stores. They have been relatively unsuccessful. Hard drives remain the choice for low IO density, low, small number of IOs per second per gigabyte. <clears throat> um, applications that do large IOs, you know, things like video streaming, um, and sub-second latency. When we start um, moving on to applications with very low IO densities and requirements, latency requirements in the minutes, tape becomes attractive. But for latencies from you know, two minutes down to 100 milliseconds, hard drives and combinations of hard drives will remain the, the systems of choice for the next decade. <clears throat> I read a paper, uh, read an interview with Randy Katz, one of the original authors of the seminal RAID paper, where he said that he thought RAID would first be used in the high performance market. Uh, but it was the PC market where it took off because we were looking for resiliency because the disk drives we were using were um, relatively crappier than the disk drives that the guys in the mini computer world were using. By 1993, as the first servers, as distinct from desktops, came to market, they all included RAID controllers. Uh, many of them used the Intel i960 RISC processor, which was optimized for the XOR operation that's part of RAID. Um, and for a long time, what defined a server was that it had a large number of hot swap disk drives so that I could make it a netware file server or later a uh, Windows NT file server. <clears throat> the next step was adding cache, and that really first happened with EMC Symmetrics, which had a whopping um, 20, 256 megabytes of cache, so the same as a disk drive today, uh, to manage 252, excuse me, 24 gigabytes of disk, um, which is just slightly larger than a disk drive today. 
and that meant we had batteries and batteries meant so if the data in the cache could be protected through a power failure then we could have a write back cache and accelerate writes as well as reads and that meant we had battery backups and batteries became the storage administrator's bane for the next decade or so over the years features have become standard in raid systems hot spares which became global hot spares configuration on disks so that moving disks between slots doesn't destroy the array and so forth <coughs> which you know some additional reading on disk drive history from blogs i've written at network computing and that brings us basically to the end of today's episode um, we still have a long way to go, so I, I may have to turn this into more than however many parts we decided it was going to be to start with. So the floor is now open to questions. Uh, Graham has a comment saying he remembers the RLL interleaf factor when doing a low-level format on a drive. Yeah, so... The earliest ST506 drives um, uh, used a modified frequency modulation recording method that stuck one clock bit in for every four data bits so that it could separate data properly. Because while disk drives spin at a constant speed, there's constant and there's constant enough for data separation. <clears throat> RLL, run length limited coding, recognized the fact that it was easy to separate clock from data as long as the data was switching from zero to one. But what you really didn't want to have was more than some small number of ones or zeros consecutively because it would become hard to know whether that was 12 ones or 13 ones with timing. And so RLL encoding used fewer clock bits and gave you 50% higher density. But the decoding took a little bit more CPU time. So a drive that might work with an interleave of two or three with MFM, when you formatted it with RLL, would need a higher interleave to give the controller more time to do the math to separate the data before it could read the next sector. <clears throat> And this is 1985. <laughs> yes, please keep them up. Oh, wait, no, that's. All right. Um, not seeing anything else on Twitter. Uh, we're in the questions pane. So uh, thank you very much, Howard. It was, it always, was great. Always a pleasure. Right. Next week, we move from simple RAID to disk arrays, shared storage, multiple controllers. We get come back to data protection. We talk a little bit about erasure codes. We talk about um, data protection with checksums and <clears throat> hashes and the like. Uh, so still lots to cover. Great. Yeah, we all look forward to it. Graham says keep them coming. So very good. Uh, thank you and good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you.